We'll, uh, we'll be on that until I get through, which may mean uh, three weeks or it may mean three months. I don't know. We're just, we just going to go till we get through. And uh, I want you to know, too, I'm excited about the new schedule. It's going to be great. Really, really great. I, uh, you know, I, I just, I, I see the hand of God in so many ways. I, I would like to say that I'm smart and intelligent, but the longer I go, the really, I really realize how dumb I am and how much God really has to help me. And, uh, you know, you're just going along and all of a sudden God lets you trip over something and you say, oh, wow, thanks, Lord. That's the way it's been this whole time. And, um, you know, we're getting back into a, a different schedule. I won't say we're getting back into normal because we're always going to be abnormal. But we're not getting back to normal, but we are getting back to um, uh, me having an opportunity to be with our Brownsville people. And really, it's the best of all worlds, because on Wednesday night, the school will be in here, and they're going to have services in here, chapel. So that's going to be great. And sometimes students are going to be preaching, and sometimes faculty is going to be preaching. And uh, people from all over the world is welcome to come, and locally, too. Uh, the revival crowd is welcome to come on Wednesday night and join them. And then on Thursday night, I'll be speaking for, and then I'll be doing prayer meeting. Uh, I hope to be, I hope to, uh, I'll probably speak somewhere, I'm not going to go long, but I'm probably going to speak somewhere in the neighborhood of 45 minutes, and uh, Lyndall's going to be with me on Thursday nights, and then in the time of, uh, <clears throat> and then in the time of prayer, during our prayer time, we're also going to be doing some live worship during prayer time. It's going to be glorious. It's going to be glorious. And I'll tell you what I think it's going to do. It's going to jack this thing up into another level. I really believe that. And then on Friday night and Saturday night, my old buddy Steve's going to be here, our evangelist. So we got the school, we got Brownsville, and then we got the revival, and then back on Sunday. So we're still in four services a week. Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Five services a week. And um, I'll get one night off now a week. I'll be coming in on Tuesdays, and I'll be, get, I'll be getting Wednesday off, all day Wednesday and Wednesday night. So I'm going to be like a human being again. So that'll feel good. So I am excited. I am, I am just beside myself. I feel like that this has happened right in the precise timing of the Holy Spirit. It's just precise timing. It's not a day too early, and it's not a day too late. It's just right. I know that in my spirit. When I woke up that Friday and I made the decision to cut the revival back to a Friday and Saturday and then to add a service with Brownsville and then the school, when I woke up that Friday morning, if I've ever heard from God in my life, I heard the Lord say three things to me that morning when I woke up. And I won't tell you about them today, but I'll be preaching a message before long on those three things that he spoke to my spirit. It just as real. I didn't hear his voice, but you know when God speaks to you. And when he spoke, I had like liquid peace come all on my insides, just like liquid peace. And I knew all was well, and I also knew that the change would be well received by everybody. I knew that it would. You know, like in the Bible, whenever they appointed deacons in the book of Acts, the Bible says that the saying pleased the whole multitude. And I knew that this saying would please the whole multitude. It's the plan of God. And it's going to give Steve a chance to do what Steve needs to do. Uh, as far as doing maybe some overseas things uh, first part of the week or just traveling elsewhere. And then he'll get to be back here with us on Fridays and Saturdays. It's also going to give him a chance to uh, do some writing and uh, give him a chance to do some, some more in-depth praying. So it's going to be good for everybody. It's going to be good for everybody. So I want to see you in our services on Thursday night for sure. And then, of course, on Friday and Saturday. I believe that uh, there's some interesting days ahead for America and the world. I don't know what, but I'm not a prophet and I'm not a seer, but I'm a feeler. I can feel it. Amen? I can just feel it coming. But anyway, Lyndall's going to sing two songs. You sure you just don't want me to do one? No, nah, I want you to do two, brother. I don't want to eat into your time. No, no, no. My time is your time. Oh, no. But what we're going to do... What we're going to do is we're going to sing two songs, and I'm going to come up here and preach. 
And then as soon as I preach, I'm going to dismiss everybody. Now listen, those of you in the Family Life Center, everybody's going to gather outside. As soon as I get through here, we're going to dismiss everybody. We're all going to gather outside. We're just going to gather around the front of the building. And then uh, there's a PA system set up out there on the porch. And uh, I'm going to address everybody. And then Ken Evans, our builder, is here with us this morning. And he's going to address everybody for a few minutes. And then we're all going to walk inside, but they're going to take time after we dismiss in here, they're going to take time to remove the chairs over there in that building. And everybody's just going to go in and stand. And I think we can get about three or 4,000 people in there standing. So uh, we're all going to go in there and stand, and we're going to have 15 shofars. All right. so it's going to blow. And uh, we're going to blow the devil right out of there. And then... After we uh, sound the shofars, I'm going to actually uh, dedicate the building, and then we're going to have a time of worship, and we're going to do what I'm going to preach this morning. After I get through my message, you'll understand it a little bit better. He teaches my hands to war. Lindell?
your Bibles, please, in your hands. Psalms 144. Psalms 144.
I got a feeling. I've really got a feeling. I don't know what's up, but I know my God, and he's a God of surprises. I like the suddenlies of God. Don't you like the suddenlies of God? God's got a bunch of suddenlies that I love. Sometimes things just rock along. You know, you sort of get adjusted to things, you know, the status quo, and then all of a sudden, suddenly, God does something. I like that. I feel like we're on the verge of a suddenly. I really do. I feel that in my spirit. Hallelujah. I think the devil knows there's a suddenly coming too. I see him this morning with great, uh, great drops of sweat all over his face. He's worried. You know, the devil knows a lot, but he's not omniscient. He cannot read God's plan and God's mind. He knows he's got a short time left, but in the meantime, he don't know what's up. Glory to God. I want to be part of what, God, of what God's got that's what's up. I want to be part of that. Psalms 144, verse 1. Blessed be the Lord, my strength, which teaches my hands to war and my fingers to fight. I like that. I like that scripture. Blessed be the Lord, my strength, which teaches my hands to war and my fingers to fight. Man, man, I know I'm not going to get through this morning, and I've only got six pages of notes, and I've only got four points. Steve would love this. I know I won't get through, but I will be back next week, Lord willing. <clears throat> you may be seated. Hallelujah. I want everybody to just keep your seat here and be as still as you can for the next 45 minutes. Give everybody a chance to settle down and we're going to get started. I have never in my life been as excited as I am at the moment that I stand here before you. There has never been quite a day like this day to be alive. I know in my knower that God is doing some powerful things. I don't know exactly what and when, but I know that we are in his plan I know I am in his plan. I know that you are in his plan and something is up. I believe in the days to come. Somebody says, Brother Kilpatrick, do you believe that Jesus is going to come before the year 2000? That's in God's timing. I don't know. If he doesn't come till 2020, that's fine with me too. Because between now and 2020, there's going to be a lot of things to do and a lot of things to see. And heaven is the arrival date, but while we're still here, I believe this is the church's most finest hour. And uh, there are some great things that's going to be happening. Now this morning I want to take my time, and I want to just ease into this, and I want you to understand some powerful truths. This will be a series that will hopefully pull the lid back and let you see some truths that God is trying to teach us. Sometime our world is too small. Sometime our world has shrunk around us. And sometime we get so enamored with our own little world that we fail to realize that there's a lot going on around us that we have never yet investigated. Are you hearing me? God is an awesome, great, magnificent God. He is the only God. He is the giver of life. God is not only the giver of life to us, but he's the giver of life to everything. I don't care whether it's um, a dog or a cat, a donkey, rhinoceros, hippopotamus, Everything that lives and breathes 
is God's. The Bible said that even the gold is God's. And I want to tell you something else. I do not believe in New Age mentalities and philosophies. I don't believe in uh, the force. I believe in the only true God. That's what I believe in. But I do believe that if, even in the earth, there's things to do with the earth that we have not yet come to understand. I believe that the world is coming to grips with the world and the earth itself, but it's in a perverted way. Their knowledge about the earth is in a perverted way. They call it the mother earth and the forces and the magnetic fields and all these things, and that's perverted. But I believe that somewhere out there, there is a beautiful symmetry of the same kind of life that God has given to us that is in other forms in other areas of even the earth that we live on. And I'm going to show you this morning something interesting in Scripture. I'm going to work my way to it. One of the most difficult things for the body of Christ to understand and to get into is understanding the power of worship and understanding the power of praise. This is not going to be another typical message on worship and praise. One of the most difficult things to understand about worship is its unique connection. It has a unique connection to suffering, affliction, and adversity. Worship is indelibly linked to affliction, adversity, and suffering. It seems like our worship becomes more precious to God when it is given out of a heart that is going through adversity and suffering and rough times. That worship, willful worship out of our heart and that willful praise out of our heart is enriched in the nostrils of God in those times that we go through that is so difficult. I think every living thing has a particular environment in which it excels. Listen closely. I think that every living thing has a particular environment in which it excels. The eagle excels in the air. The eagle was created by God to soar, and as it stretches its wings wide, and it catches the draft and the currents that you can't even see, that eagle has eyesight, and it has a wingspan, that that's his realm, that's his world, that's what he was created for. And where other birds can only go so high, where other fowl can only do other things, the eagle excels in his realm because that's what he was created by God to do. That's his environment. The dolphin excels in the water. That's his environment, that's his realm. That's what he was created by God to do. And as you're out in the ocean and you see those dolphins as they swim alongside, it's so beautiful and so peaceful and so refreshing and so exciting to see those dolphins excelling in their environment. You take them and put them on the ground, they would die. But you leave them where God created them far and they excel and they flourish. The cheetah is created for the ground. The cheetah excels on the ground. He can run up to speeds of over 60 miles an hour. He's a running machine because God created an environment for the cheetah and that's where he excels. And just as every mammal, just as every living creature created by God has an environment where they excel, I want to come before you this morning and remind you that God also has an environment where God excels and is called worship. Friend, God does not excel in complaining and murmuring. 
God excels where there is a place prepared for him by the glorious worship and the glorious praise of a holy and a righteous and a clean living people. God excels in worship. I want to tell you something. You can change your environment by making a quality decision to worship God in the midst of your adversity and your pain and your suffering. And God will come on the scene and God will give you a miracle. I believe by our worship and by our praise, we create a big seat. A big throne for God to walk down and sit down on and watch us and get involved in our daily life. God excels in our worship. Paul and Silas were beaten. I want you to think about it for a moment. They were beaten. They were hurting. Their pain was real. Their lacerations had blood drawn to the top of their skin surface. They were in great pain. Their life was in peril. They had been cussed. They had been abused. They had been mishandled. They had been mistreated. They had been verbally attacked. They had been physically attacked. And they were languishing in their pain. And it was a real pain. And it was a real adversity. And I want to tell you something, friend. Whenever you start going through an adversity, you've got a choice. You can murmur and complain and bellyache and God will stay away. Or either you can say, bless the Lord, oh my soul and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. And God says, what's that I hear? And God will come down and he will begin to change the environment. I want to tell you something. You have an opportunity to change the environment where you are. If things are not going well, go ahead and bellyache and murmur and complain. It's not going to do anything for you or anybody else because you see the Bible said Paul and Silas was in prison and there were other prisoners there and everybody was a moaning and a groaning, insecure and unhappy. But when two men made up their mind and said, I don't like this, I'm going to bring God on the scene. They begin to glorify God and the prisoners begin to hush up their moaning and their groaning and their complaining. I want to tell you, you have the propensity within you, gifted by God, to change your environment where even other people around you can be changed. And all of a sudden, as they begin to praise God, the prisoners hushed up their mumbling and their grumbling, and they begin to listen to them praise the Lord. And God said, I think I hear something down there on the earth. And so he put on some kind of shoes that was heavy, and God began to walk down on the earth toward that prison. And as God began to walk, the prison began to shake and quake. I tell you, friend, I look forward to the day that God walks into Brownsville, and the whole building shakes under the power of God. I said, I look forward to the day that God walks in our midst. The Bible said, and the place where they were was shaken. I pray that we begin to glorify God with clean hands and a clean heart, that God begins to walk in our midst and the place is literally moving around under the power of God. I want to tell you something. In the ministry, you've got all kind of people you have to deal with. In the ministry, I don't care how long you've been pastoring in, in the crowd like this, you're going to have newborn babies, you're going to have toddlers, you're going to have adolescents, you're going to have teenagers, spiritually speaking, and you're going to have the white-haired, gray-haired, matured saints. Spiritually speaking, you've got them all. Well, one of the things that I don't think I'll ever get over in the ministry is the mumblers and the complainers and the grumblers. I don't think I'll ever get over. As a matter of fact, I've heard so much of it down through the years from good people. People that look holy on the outside, look Pentecostal on the outside. Their hair is just right. Their suit and their dress is just right. Everything looks really Pentecostal like they've really had an experience with God. But they open up their mouth and their tongue is a two-edged sword that'll cut you both ways. They'll cut you coming in and going out. They'll cut up the preacher. They'll cut up the board. They'll cut up the staff. They'll cut up one another. Cut up their own family members. But they look holy. I wouldn't give you a plug Indian nickel for that kind of religion. I tell you, friend, it doesn't really matter sometimes what you look like on the outside. It's what you are on the inside. 
God is not looking at the length of our hair. God is not looking at how we do our hair. God's not looking at that Pentecostal dress that we've got on. God is looking at our heart. And God, as he looks at our heart, he said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Now, I want to tell you something about that. God is looking for your mouth to glorify him. Every time I see a grumbler, I want to dart for the nearest door. If I'm walking down the hall and I see a mumbler and a grumbler, and believe me, I've pastored some. Sister Busybody. Brother Acid Mouth. I've pastored them. I've pastored them. I've had their acid tear my hide up. Sister Busybody, eventually I find out who she is and I have to call her. And I say, Sister Busybody, this is Brother Kilpatrick. <laughs> and Sister Busybody, I want to let you know, you may have done this in years past, but you're not going to continue to do it here. Because if you don't hush it, I'll deal with you privately, but if I have to pull you up before the whole church and let them know you're so in discord and dissension, I'll do it. I want you to know that. Let me tell you something, friend. I believe that we deserve what we tolerate. I said I believe we deserve what we tolerate. And if we tolerate ourselves mumbling and grumbling and complaining, nobody wants to hear it. I don't want to hear it. My wife doesn't want to hear it. You don't even want to hear it. After a while, it may feel good for the first few minutes or the first few hours or the first few days, but after a while, you don't even want to hear it anymore. And let me tell you something. If we're like that about mumbling and grumbling and complaining, what is God like? Every time we start mumbling and grumbling and complaining, does it make God want to race to our scene and say, Oh, I'm here. No, it doesn't. But praise and worship in adversity and in affliction and in suffering has a sweet smelling savor that goes up in the nostrils of God and it gets God's attention and he looks our way and God comes on the scene. Now I want you to go with, some, go with me to some scriptures real quick and I want to show you some powerful truths. Go to Zechariah. That's almost toward the last of your Old Testament. Zechariah. I want to go to chapter 14. I want to show you a powerful scripture. I love the scriptures, don't you? I love the scriptures. You just go to chapter 14. I want to show you something. You might be sitting out there a little, a little bit peeved with me right now. Some of you are probably sitting out there and you're a little bit peeved and you're thinking... Well, Brother Kilpatrick, good gracious, can't we gripe and complain sometime? No. No, you can't. No. Well, I don't like you anymore, Brother Kilpatrick. I know. I know that. I knew that account of the cost before I said it. But I'm telling you something you need to hear. It's just like a doctor. If you go to a doctor, the doctor's not going to tell you what you want to hear. He's going to tell you what you've got to hear. And I'm not called by God to sugarcoat things and tell you what you want to hear. I'm here to tell you what you've got to hear. God does not like our mumbling and grumbling and complaining spirit. And that will shut off the blessings of the Lord. You say, I don't believe that. Well, I'm going to show you a scripture. <laughs> Hallelujah, we've already taken the offering. Now, let me ask you something. What do you think rain in the Bible represents? What do you think rain represents? Blessing. Exactly. Rain in the Bible represents blessing. God wants to bless you, and he calls it rain. Now, there's also a Bible. The Bible talks about latter rain and all that stuff, but even that's talking about the blessings of God giving literal H2O coming down from the clouds. And he's talking about giving the former rain and the latter rain all in the same month in order to get the harvest, and the harvest is a blessing. So anytime you read in the Bible, look this way. Now listen to me, everybody. I'm going to show you a powerful scripture. Anytime you read about rain in the Bible, you're reading about blessings and desired things from God. I want to show you an interesting scripture in Zechariah 14. Y'all want to see it? Do you really want to see it? How bad do you want to see it? All right. 
There's people watching us on television saying, those people are crazy. <laughs> You're right, friend, we are. <laughs> Zechariah 14, 17. It said, and it shall be that whosoever will not come up. Look at this. Zechariah 14, 17. It shall be that whosoever will not come up of all the families of the earth unto Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, even upon them shall be no rain. Now I could just park there for a while. Let me show you something. This is talking about in Zechariah. It's talking about the Old Testament saints. It's talking about Jerusalem. It's talking about when the people were called and summoned to Jerusalem to worship. If they wouldn't come up to worship, Zechariah said that God told him as a prophet to tell them if they won't come and worship me, they can forget my blessings. Let me read it to you one more time. Zechariah 14 and 17. It shall be that whosoever will not come up of all the families of the earth unto Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, even upon them, shall be no rain. Say it with me. No rain. Whosoever will not come up to worship the king. Look at that. Whosoever will not come up to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, even upon them shall be no rain. Now, a while ago when I talked about mumbling and grumbling and complaining, you felt like you had a license to do that? And you didn't want me tampering with your pity party? And you didn't want me tampering with some kind of a personality thing you got going on here like, well, I've always been like that and I feel good to ventilate. Why don't you start ventilating in the positive? Why don't you just start ventilating like a fish in the positive? Glory to God. It'll make you feel so much better. Make your wife even want to be around you. Make your husband want to be around you. Make your kids want to stay at home, eat supper around the table. Instead of saying, oh my God, I, just, I don't know. I don't know. Just start saying, hallelujah, glory to God. Your kids is going to be drawn back for a while. They may have to take some, some, some kind of anison or, or something to, to help them get over it because they're going to see such a change it's probably going to really freak them out. But I tell you, friend, we need to start just glorifying God. Everything that hath breath, praise the Lord. Let everything that hath breath, the Bible said, praise the Lord. It didn't say let everything that hath breath moan and groan and complain. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Well, watch this. One reason I love to worship is because I love the rain. All day long, my wife will tell you this, we, we praise the Lord all day. When we're together, we praise the Lord. This week, we've just praised the Lord together all week long. We ride along, we praise the Lord. We're sitting around the table, we praising the Lord. Just praising Him, just worshiping the Lord. God, you're so good. And your mercies are everlasting. Woo! Your mercies endure from generation to generation. We've just been worshiping God. And you know what that does? God's going to send the rain. I don't know about other pastors, and I don't know about other churches. The only thing I know about is my own, and I made up my mind I'm not going to grumble and mumble and complain. At Brownsville, I, as a pastor, am going to worship God, and I believe this church is going to worship God with me, and I believe the rain of the Holy Ghost is going to come in these last days upon this church. Oh, there's going to be opportunities for the devil to get you to go back in the old way. But friend, I want to remind you, whenever you feel those feelings of agitation and frustration and depression, and you want to come out with words that are negative and mumbling and grumbling and complaining, I want to ask you to put the brakes on right there, and it may betray every emotion you've got. But say, praise ye the Lord. And I tell you what God will do. God will say, now there's a man right there that won't be, his situation and circumstances won't dictate how he talks. Rain. It says, they that won't come up and worship the king will get no rain. They that will come up and worship the king will get my blessings. You say, does God discriminate like that? Always has and always will. Now the Bible said he makes his literal rain to come down on the just and the unjust. 
But it's talking about here in the book of Zechariah, the families of the earth that will not come up and worship. You know what you do when you worship? I don't call mumbling and grumbling and complaining worshiping. Like, well, you failed me again. Is that worshiping? You let me down again, God. I don't know what the world I'm going to do. God says, oh, I'm going to send my rain on you, son. Does that make sense? You come and bow your knee before God and say, I'm going through hell, Lord. But I worship you. I love you, Jesus. You've never failed me one time, Jesus. And the Lord says, "Uh uh-huh, I see you going through hell, but I'm about to send a thunderburst over your house. I'm going to bless you. Shoot. (laughs) I feel this friend glory to God you know where Joshua is in the Bible (laughs) no he's in heaven I know that (laughs) Joshua 3 (laughs) somebody say he's in heaven Joshua 3 Hallelujah. I want to show you something beautiful. I love the presence of the Lord. Because where the presence of the Lord is, there's change, good change. I love the presence of the Lord because there's no humdrum, there's no morbidity. None of those things where the presence of the Lord is. Where the presence of the Lord is, there's throbbing life. There's throbbing blessings. God, at an early time in Israel's history, got them right across. I want to tell you something about Israel while I'm thinking about it. I saw something about Israel the other day that I want to just share with you. Ken Gott preaches a message about amateurs and professionals. And I love that message that he preaches. I heard him preach it here at Brownsville. And I heard him mention that. I don't remember the whole sermon, but he's talking about amateurs and professionals. And he said, as long as we remain amateurs and don't know how to do it, God will shine brightly and greatly through us. But once we become a professional, God will back away and leave it to us. Amen? You know, God is looking for people that will be dependent upon him. He loves us to be like little children. You know, my little grandkids will hang on my legs. They'll look up at me. They'll talk to me. My boys, when they were coming up, it was daddy. They looked to daddy. They needed daddy. Daddy could do anything. Daddy could fix anything. Daddy was daddy. And my kids needed me, and they clung to me like a vine to a wall. God's saying to the church, you become too professional. You've learned how to do it. You don't cling to me anymore. You don't lovingly wrap your arms around my legs and look up at me with a beautiful little countenance saying, I love you, Daddy. You can do anything, Daddy. But one thing the Lord showed me last night, and this is so good, it just really made an impact on my spirit as I was preparing this series, He teaches my hands to war and my fingers to fight. Listen to this. Where was Israel for all those years? Where were they? They were in bondage. What kind of bondage? They were in bondage in Egypt under Pharaoh. Now, what do you do when you're in bondage? It means you're like a prisoner. The Israeli women, women had to serve as midwives. They couldn't serve really as housewives. They, they just was enslaved. The men had to mix mortar and make mud, type bricks. They were misused, abused, mistreated. They were treated like slaves. Israel was in Egyptian bondage for a long time. A long time. They were in Egyptian bondage. They had their babies. Their babies came up knowing nothing but bondage and knowing nothing but enslavement. Isn't it interesting? Now you think about this for a minute. Look this way, everybody, and listen. Isn't it interesting that when God brought them out of Egyptian bondage, Nobody knew how to fight. That's why God told Israel many times, you will not need to fight in this battle. Just praise me and I'll fight the battle for you. God knew the Amalekites, the Moabites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, 
and all the parasites. God knew all of them, and he knew they were skilled warriors. They thought they were heathen. They knew how to wield the bow and arrow. They knew how to wield the sword. They knew how to ride the horse. They knew how to fight with their hands. They were skilled warriors. But when Israel came out of bondage, they were slaves. They had never held a spear. They had never held a bow and arrow. They had never held a stave or a knife in their hand. They were slaves. And so when they came out and God delivered them with a mighty hand and brought them out into the wilderness, they didn't know how to fight. I want to tell you something. I think it behooves us all for us to remain ignorant of knowing how to fight. Can you say amen? Once you learn how to fight with your brother, once you learn how to fight in the world's way, once you learn how to fight in this world system, once you learn how to fight in the carnal and the natural, God will back up and say, okay, you want to do that? Go ahead. You remember? Israel wanted to be a nation like other nations. They wanted a king like other kings, like other nations had kings. You remember that? You remember that? And then they also picked up the ways of the world. Many of them began to learn how to fight. And that's why many times when they go in and take a city and they wouldn't leave it to God to help them, God would let them just get wiped out. They'd have sin in the camp. There'd be things that they had hidden that God said, don't touch those things. Those things are holy unto me. They would take them, touch them, bury them. They'd go in and try to fight another battle and they'd be whipped. They wouldn't leave the fighting to God. I want to tell, I want to tell everybody here something. In the Family Worship Center, I want you to listen good. Don't ever learn how to wield the sword in the natural. Don't ever learn how to fight your enemies in the natural. God had him a people that he loved. They were enslaved. God could be everything to them. He brought them out with a mighty hand. He parted the Red Sea. He brought them over on the other side. He drowned Pharaoh and his army. God said, you won't need no knives. You won't need no bayonets. You won't need no machine guns. You won't need no tanks. You won't need no artillery. You won't need no bows, arrows. You won't need nothing. I'm the Lord your God. I am your defense. And I'll fight for you. That's why God said, shh, be still and see the salvation of the Lord. They were slaves. And those slaves were out there. They didn't know how to, they wouldn't know how to even work a bow and arrow. They wouldn't know how to throw a spear. They were slaves. And God said, I like you needing me like this. I like you needing me like this. I like you having to depend on me like this. I am a great and a mighty God, and I'll fight for you. But then Israel said, we want a king like other kings. We want to, we want to be a great people like other nations. We want a king reigning over us, and we want to learn how to fight. And God said, okay, go ahead. And then you begin to see 30,000 lives were lost. 35,000, 85,000 lives were lost. They begin to go into the deficit column because they wouldn't make the Lord their God, their everything. Are you listening to me? Watch this. God's got ways. Friend, let me tell you, God can take the simplest of things. Somebody sitting out there this morning, you may be a pastor, pastor's wife, or you may be just an average lay person, and you're sitting out there and saying, oh, but Brother Kilpatrick, I'm nobody. Good. You're just what God's looking for. Good. That's what God's looking for. That's, what, that's who God's looking for. He's looking for recruits just like you. Moses said, he couldn't speak. He was a stutterer. God said, just hush, boy. He said, I am the Lord God that made your mouth. Somebody shout amen. amen. I am the Lord God that made your mouth. Put that tongue in your mouth. I can do anything. I found me a man that's a stutterer. He doesn't have confidence in the flesh. But if you'll let me, son, I'll make a mighty man of God out of you. God's looking for the weak things of the world and the base things of the world. And Moses, after God healed his stuttering and he gave him Aaron to be a spokesman, Moses still felt inferior. Moses standing out there one day and God said, Moses, I just can't, I just can't, I just can't. I'm so overwhelmed. God said, what's that in your hand? Don't you like God? Don't you love the way he does things like that? He didn't say, go down to Sears, boy. <laughs> I mean, 
You're standing out there. All you got is a stupid stick in your hand. Moses looked at him. He said, well, it's a stick. God said, that's good enough. Moses said, you serious? <laughs> you, 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 you serious? <laughs> and he's got that stick in his hand. And God said, throw it down. And he threw it down. And God did great things. Stick your hand in your robe. Well, his hand something he already had. Pulled it out and it was leprous. Stick it back in there. Pulled it out and it was just like a baby skin. You know what God was trying to tell him? You're too professional. You've been in Egypt too long. You've seen how Pharaoh does things. I'm not Pharaoh. I'm God. Somebody with me? So all of a sudden, now they get out in the wilderness. And God tells them what he wants them to do. So they construct this piece of furniture, this piece of equipment. Now we're in the book of Joshua. We're past Exodus. Moses is gone. Joshua, the associate, takes over. Moses is dead. God buried him. So now they got this piece of furniture. I love the way God works. Look at jo uh, Joshua 3.13. Verse 12, 3 verse 12. Now therefore take you 12 men out of the tribes of Israel, out of every tribe of man, and it shall come to pass as the soles of the feet of the priests that bear the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, shall rest as their feet, as the soles of their feet shall rest in the waters of Jordan, that the waters of Jordan shall be cut off from the waters that come down from above, and they shall stand up upon a heap. I want to show you a little truth here in this scripture. God said, I want those Levites, those priests that bear the ark. God said, I want them that bear the ark. He said, as soon as the soles of their feet touches the water. And they had those staves and they were carrying the ark. He said, as soon as the soles of their feet touches the water, God said, you do what I tell you to do where you are. But they never saw what God was going to do on his end. They only saw what happened when they did what they did on their end. Let me tell you something about praise and worship. Sometime the preacher says, lift your hands and lift your voices. We're not just trying to impress people when we say that. Because listen, we can sing a song and get volume. I'm not trying to get everybody here to worship so somebody on the platform will look good. And we're not just trying to get people to worship and lift their voices because we're trying to have some kind of a big shindig. What we're trying to do is the Holy Spirit's trying to get us to do what we can do here and put our souls in the water and we'll see something happen here. But you may never see what God does in the invisible on the other end that you never know about. Watch this. Look at verse 13 again. This is Joshua 3 and verse 13. It said, It shall come to pass as soon as the soles of the feet of the priests that bear the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, shall rest in the waters of Jordan, that the waters of Jordan shall be cut off from the waters that come down from above, and they shall stand upon a heap. In other words, here's what, here's what it's saying. You do what I tell you to do. Tell the priest to put their feet, the soles of their feet in the water. And they put their feet in the water. And they saw the water ripple around the soles of the feet. And it seemed like probably nothing was happening. But all of a sudden, God said, up at the waters of the Jordan at the other end, I'm going to do something that you can't see. And I'll cause the waters to be cut off, and I'll make them stand up on a heap. What they did was what they could do. You just obey. Put the soles of your feet. Do exactly as I tell you to do. Levites, soles of the feet, bearing the ark. You do that. And as soon as they did that, God went where they couldn't see. And God did something to the river. They did something to the river. But God really did something to the river. Now, it's interesting. I'm going to close with this because I've got to quit. My time is up. But it's interesting. Watch this. I've never got over this scripture in all the years of ministry. Every time I read it, it still takes me back. 
I'm going to show you something. I'm going to show you two scriptures real quick. I got five minutes to do it in. You believe I can do it? I don't. Watch this. Go to Exodus 14. I never have been able to get over this scripture. Even when I read it today, it still mesmerizes me. Exodus 14. Have you found it? If you found it, look this way. I want to tell you something. For years, I thought that God parted the Red Sea. Look at this. In Exodus... chapter 14, look at verse 15. Let, let's go back to verse 13. It says, Moses said unto the people, fear not. Now look at verse 13 one more time. Look back at it. It said, who said to the people? Look at this. Now get a load of this, friend. Look at me, everybody. Moses said to the people, there's a lot of times we can think we know what God is doing. And we stand up and we say, fear not. You know, we wax eloquent religiously and spiritually, and we just tell him people how things are. And Moses gets up there, and he says, Fear not. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show to you today. For the Egyptians whom you have seen today, you shall see them again no more. The Lord will fight for you, and you shall hold your peace. But look at verse 15. God says, <coughs> Amen. I can just hear him now. <clears throat> he does it real deep. <clears throat> and verse 15, the Lord said unto Moses, What? Why are you crying unto me? Speak unto the children of Israel that they go forward. And in verse 16 it says, But lift up your rod and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it. Look at that. And God said, the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. And then God said, you do that, and then I'll harden the hearts of the Egyptians. And they'll follow them, and I will get me honor upon Pharaoh, and upon all this host, and upon his chariots and his horsemen. And all the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I've gotten me honor. But look at this now. I don't have time, boy. I'm just getting to the best part of this message, and I've got to quit. I'm going to talk to you about uplifted hands. I'm going to say that to next week. I've got to, friend. Even when God raises his right hand. Boy, there's some scriptures that will absolutely, you need to be here next week, next Sunday, because I'm going to have time to get into this a lot more. But look, now look, I, I want to show you one more scripture. This is one of my favorite scriptures I'm about to take you to. It is awesome. Don't put your Bibles up yet. The best is yet to come. I'm going to give you one more scripture. This is beautiful. I bet you've never seen, I don't bet. I imagine. I imagine that you've never seen this before. Watch this. Okay, now let me give you a picture. Here's the Red Sea now. Now before, that was Joshua and the Jordan River. God said when they put their soles and feet in, I'll... I'll heap up the river up here, and then you go across. But now this is, let's revert back to Moses for a minute. Here's Moses standing up there. And God said, <coughs> <coughs> sounds good, son, but that's not the way it's going to work. God said, stretch out your rod. Look at it. Verse 16, lift up your rod and stretch out your hand. Look this way just for a minute. This is interesting to me as it can be. There's something here, and next week I'm going to take you a little bit deeper into it, and we're going to learn something. God said, lift up your rod. He lifts up that big old rod. And then God said, stretch out your hand. And here he is like this. And look at verse 16. 
It says it in your Bible too. Look at it. And divide it. Lift up your rod. Stretch out your hand. You do it. You know what God's saying to a lot of us? We're saying, I love you so much, Jesus. You're so good to me. You fight all my battles. He said, "Mm mm-mm. Remember my apostle said, put on the whole armor of God. You're not fighting in the natural, but God said, I'm going to give you discernment to know how to fight in the spiritual. Now, Moses stood up there, lifted up the rod, and he stretched forth his hand. Watch this now. And the Bible said, the sea divided. Now, the beginning of my message, I shared something with you, and I try to be very discreet how I shared it because I don't want anybody to think I'm a new ager. But I'm telling you that the Creator has given life, and I don't think we've yet tapped in to understand just how alive everything is around us. I'm going to show you two things real quick. The Bible said that the whole creation, what? Groans and travails. The whole creation does. You know what the Bible said when the Lord comes back? At his second coming, and especially during the millennial return, uh, the millennial reign of the Lord, you know what the Bible says about that? It says, even the trees of the field will clap their hands. Can't you imagine that old oak that you hung a tire from and a rope? And you just thought it was dead. You just thought that thing had no personality at all. That old oak out there, when the Lord comes back, it's going to say, glory to God. I can see that old rope and tire just a flopping like that. Amen. <laughs> glory to God. Hallelujah. God came down and visited Moses and even the mountains was so animated under the presence of God that even the mountains responded. I feel that, friend. But watch this. This is beautiful. Do you think a sea has personality? An ocean, a sea? Go to Psalms. Y'all with me? I'm doing good on my time. I'm two minutes over. Psalms 114. I want to show you something that absolutely is beautiful. Look at verse 1 of 114. Y'all got your Bibles? Don't be looking at me. Look at them Bibles, folks. If I see your face, I'm on. And Israel went out of Egypt, the house of Jacob from a people. Look, it says, when Israel went out of Egypt, God delivered them. The house of Jacob from a people of a strange language, Egyptians. Judah was his sanctuary and Israel his dominion. And look at verse 3. The sea saw it. What? The sea saw it and fled. Even Jordan was driven back. The mountains skipped like rams, and the little hills like lambs. What aileth thee, O sea, that you have fled? Thou Jordan, what ails you that you was driven back? You mountains, you that skip like rams and little hills like lambs, tremble, thou earth, at the presence of the Lord, at the presence of the God of Jacob. Man, I feel the anointing. Wow. That last verse, which turned the rock into standing water and the flint into a fountain of waters. I got chill bumps all over me. It said when Moses stood there, look, when Moses stood there, God said, lift up your rod. Now God said, lift up your hand. You know what the Bible said? The sea saw it. I 
I wonder sometime when we get together in church, we think we've dressed up and come in here and we're all a little nucleus in here and there's nothing going on. We're just in here together. Oh, no, 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 no. I want to tell you, angels are looking on. I want to tell you, the Holy Ghost is looking on. And sometime we might think we're lifting up our hands and just saying, glory to God. But the angels and the Holy Spirit sees those hands go up and it activates something in glory. You can't tell me I'll go to my grave believing this. You cannot tell me that in this church over the last next to almost four years, that there has not been an interchange between us and heaven on a regular basis in this place. While other people are out there killing us and griping and murmuring and complaining and criticizing and tearing us down in a negative way, we've been in here doing these things and heaven has seen it and God has been activated on our part. Friend, let me tell you something. It has always been like that, and it will always be like that. The world will never understand. The Bible said it is foolishness unto them. Even when the tabernacle was erected in the wilderness, it was surrounded by badger skins, and everybody that would come by and see those old badger skins, you would look at that and think, well, my God, there's nothing to that. People come by and they see that crowd lined up outside this church and they see all those people out there and they drive by and they sneer and say, oh, they're in there getting their money. They see badger skins. But oh, come on inside. I said, come on inside. God's doing something. You get inside and you see the blue overlaid with gold. It's ornate, it's majestic, it's beautiful. The Bible said the sea saw it. I started to name this sermon the seesaw sermon. <laughs> but I knew nobody would buy it. The seesaw sermon. The sea saw it. Listen to me. The sea saw it. Here's a man, stutterer. Here's a bunch of people who don't even know how to fight. Y'all listen to me? Don't even know how to fight. Don't know how to handle a spear. Don't know how to handle a bone arrow. They're not, they're not marksmen. They're not snipers. They're not warriors. They're just a bunch of people that's come out by beating, being beat down all their life. Somebody says, I've been beat down all my life. Great, you're, you're, you're in. <laughs> Bible says not many wise, not many nobles called. Amen? You're in. And the Lord said, I tell you what now, I'm not going to ask you to do what only I can do. You do what you do and I'll do what I do. God said to Moses, stutter it. God said, take your rod, boy. Lift it up. Can you do that? Yeah, Lord, I can do that. God said, now raise your right hand. Or raise your hand. Can you do that? Yes, sir. And all of a sudden, the Bible said the sea blinked its eyes and said, uh-oh. Amen. I've got to quit. There is no quitting place in this message, but I've got to quit. Can't you imagine the widow Zarephath, a man of God walks in. When the man of God walks in, that meal barrel says, whoa. Wow. Man of God's in the house. And he says, fix me a little cake first. But that's going to take all I got. And I know it. Meal barrel says, I feel pregnant. <laughs> Amen? Just wire and slats. She reached under and scraped the last part out of that meal barrel, scraped it out. And that meal barrel says, I feel fertile. And she went over there and cooked him something. The man of God put the first bite in his mouth. And all of a sudden, meal started gathering in the bottom of the barrel. Sometimes we think our little gestures are not important. The Bible said the sea saw it. Stand to your feet. Yo! Shoo! 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 Man alive. Holy Ghost. Can't nobody tell me no different. We serve a mighty God. 
When I get to heaven one day, I don't want the Lord to look at me and say, your, your kids heard you say all kind of stuff, boy. You might have pastored Brownsville. You might have been one of the leaders in that mighty revival, but your kids, all they ever heard you do is mumbling, griping, and complain. You know what I want the Lord to hear me say? You know what I want the, to, to hear the Lord say? I want to hear him say, son, I excel in an atmosphere of praise and worship. And I could bless you in your home and I could bless you in your church. A dolphin excels in the water. An eagle excels in the air. A cheetah excels on the ground. And God excels in the atmosphere of worship. Hallelujah. Lift your hands. Yeah. Lift your hands. Shout. Hallelujah. Bless ye the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Satan in the name of Jesus. Wow. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. Continually be in my mouth. Shay, Lord. Shay, Lord. At the Family Worship Center, if you will, the Family Life Center, if that crowd over there will go ahead and begin to move on out so they can begin to take up the chairs before I dismiss this audience. We're going to take just a few more minutes of praise before we join everybody out in the parking lot. I'm going to ask you, please, nobody leave. Somehow God wants that building dedicated today. 
Somehow it's special. I don't understand. We're all going to gather in there in a moment. Every one of us, all the thousands of us, are going to merge in there together. I think there's about a thousand people in the worship center. I'm going to ask you to move out of the worship center so they can take down the chairs. And we're all going to go over in a moment. We're going to stand there, shoulder to shoulder, and we're going to praise God. Whew. Go ahead, if you will, in the family worship center and begin to gather out in the parking lot. Please don't leave, though. Don't crank your car up and leave. I want everybody to stay together. We're going to dedicate that building at high noon. So go ahead and be making your way out. Everybody in here, continue on for a few minutes. Bless the Lord, bless the Lord, bless the Lord, bless the Lord in this place. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come. The whole earth is full of His glory. Mama ne mori, mama ne. Bless the Lord, bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless His holy name, for He inhabits the praises of His people. Great God, great God, great God of the heavens above and the earth beneath. Let this visitation turn into a habitation. No kasanamane, simani yene kabane. Shuri shama mama mani yene mene mene. Uri shikam uri shikanamoni yene mene mene. Uri kiri bili be ambola uri kiri. The Lord is in this place. Shuri kidibi. Muri kaman eni mini mini. The Lord is in this place. The Lord is in this place. This is holy ground, made holy by His presence. Mighty sword of the Lord and the fire of God in this place. The fire of God. The Lord is moving in new dimensions in our midst. Hallelujah! I want everybody to give me your attention for just a moment. We're going to move over to dedicate the Family Life Center in just a few minutes. But Pastor asked me to step up and help lead us in repentance. If there's one thing that the Lord dwells in, it's the praises of His people that come from righteous and holy hearts. Amen? The Scripture says, Love the Lord, but hate sin, you godly ones. And this message was from God because it's about warfare, and worship and praise is about warfare. The warfare is against the forces of wickedness. It's what God wants to confront, and I know, I know that He's bringing us to a new level of fight, a new, a new level of wrestling. And our wrestling has got to be against sin. We've got to get the sin out or the Lord won't come in. Amen? Some of you in this place, you may not even know the Lord. You may not even understand the terms we're speaking in. Many of you may be backslidden in heart. You know that there are habits in your life. There are words coming out of your mouth. There are attitudes in your mind that are not right with God. We need to repent. We need to turn from our sin to the righteousness of God. Who will ascend the hill of the Lord? But he who has clean hands and a pure heart, you're not going to make it in the fight if you're entertaining sin. Pastor said that we deserve what we tolerate. This is war against sin. When I go places and preach, I went one place overseas, I preached the message on real holiness, real righteousness, repentance, and the fire of God. They didn't understand I was preaching that way. They said, we thought that was just legalism. Why are you preaching that way? I said, because it's a war against sin. It's not just a matter of doing what's right so you can be religious. It's a matter of shutting the door against the enemy. Sin is bad. Sin is the enemy. Sin is destructive. 
If you are entertaining the evil one through your sin, if you are speaking curses through your grumbling over your children, over your spouse, over your roommates, over your neighbors, you need to raise your hand right now and just get the sin out. If you know you just keep it up. If grumbling's been coming out of your mouth, if you know you've been entertaining sin, if your eyes have beheld and your ears have beheld, things that let the devil in, this is war. Just get your hands up right now and leave them up for a second. I'm going to lead you in a prayer. And let this moment be for you a moment of repentance where you will turn away from the forces of unrighteousness and to the righteousness of God. Would you repeat this prayer after me? Father in heaven, in the name of Jesus, we turn away from sin, from grumbling, from curses. We turn to you, your righteousness, your praise, your truth. Forgive us, cleanse us, make our praise holy to you so that this visitation may become a habitation of a holy God. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Praise the Lord. You are dismissed now for the dedication. God bless you.